Hi, welcome. I'm Marlon Williams, and we're just going to be having a little video tutorial uh, today. If I were to ask the average person, why do you buy more of a good when its price falls, in all likelihood, I'd get some strange looks. The person probably would be thinking, isn't that obvious? It's cheaper. I buy more. And that would be true to some extent, but it would be an incomplete answer. Economists, we generally try to dig deeper. And in this context, in digging deeper, what we have been able to show is that when the price of a good changes, it's not simply that it becomes relatively more expensive or relatively cheaper, but also there's this what we call an income effect. The purchasing power of consumers changes and that is going to affect their purchasing behavior. With a better understanding of why consumers do what they do, why they buy what they buy, or why they change their consumption behavior, we're better able to make good policy recommendations. So for instance, if the government is interested in having some sort of tax on a specific good, and it wants to compensate consumers who are affected the most by this change, then having a deeper understanding of the difference between an income effect and a substitution effect will help us to make much better policy recommendation. Let's go ahead and talk about it a little bit more. In order for us to understand the difference between income and substitution effects, we have to sort of understand what happens to our budget line when prices change. Our budget line just sort of gives us sort of an outer bound on the combination of goods that we can buy, given the prices and the income. Let's take generally good Y and good X, just representative goods. And we could do this more generally, but in this case, just to make things a little bit easier, we're gonna think about specific income levels, price income level, price levels, uh, 10 and 10 for good Y and good X, respectively. In order for us to construct our budget line, all we need is our Y intercept and our X intercept. What do these two intercepts mean? Well, it, or Y intercept simply says, if I buy zero units of good X, how many units of good Y can I buy? That just means I'm spending the entirety of my income on good Y, and likewise, or X intercept simply says, I'm spending the entirety of my income on good X. So in this case, where <clears throat> we have income of 30, price of y of 10 and price of x of 10, then these are just 3 and 3. I spend the entirety of my income on y, I get 3 units, spend the entirety of my income on x, I also can buy 3 units, and everywhere in between here just says I'm spending all of my money on these goods. Let's now assume that the price of good x falls. Let's assume it falls to 5. So recognize firstly <coughs> here that our x-intercept now changes. I can now buy twice as much as I used to be able to buy. The price of y, we're assuming, hasn't changed, and so this intercept does not change. Our new budget line, the green line there, we've depicted as just a pivot off the budget line outwards. What does this mean? The first thing is what consumers generally would respond. The good is cheaper. More Specifically, the good is relatively cheaper. So the price of x divided by the price of y originally was 1. That's saying to us, if the consumer wants one more unit of good x, in a real sense, he or she has to give up exactly one unit of good y. That's the real, that's the relative price of good x. Know that the price of x has fallen or new relative price of x, px over py is now 0.5. It's saying, if I want one more unit of x, I only have to give up a half of a unit of good y. That's what consumers generally talk about. The relative price of good x is now lower. We're going to talk about that on the next slide. But a second thing happens. Recognize here that all of the bundles that exist in this shaded region 
originally we couldn't purchase it. The consumer couldn't purchase it. Because everything to the left, that's what we can afford. But know that the price of good X has fallen, all of these now become available to us. We describe that as just an increase in our budget set. It's simply saying to us that <clears throat> there are no new bundles, more bundles that we can buy. It's saying that the consumer's purchasing power has increased. Even though their income hasn't changed by the fact that the price of at least one good that they buy has fallen, they're now, in a sense, better off. In a real sense, they're better off. So one way of interpreting this is that for all quantities of good X, I can now buy more good Y. Think about it initially. Originally, when we purchased three units of X, we couldn't afford any units of Y. Now, if I, if I buy three units of X, because it's cheaper, there's money left over for me to buy some Y. So what this slide really is telling us is that when the price of the good changes, in this case, the price of the good falls, simply two things happen. The relative price of good X is now lower, and the consumer's purchasing power is higher. So when the price of the good changes, the consumer is going to change how much good X it buys, more than likely, differently based on these two changes. We're going to describe the change that results from the relative price of the good changing as a substitution effect. And we're going to describe the change that results from the consumer's purchasing power changing as being an income effect. Let's go ahead and try to decompose that right now. Let's assume we have our standard general good, good Y, general, good X. We have our original budget line, and let's assume standard convex preferences. So we have, a, we have an indifference curve that is convex that looks like this. This, we know, is going to allow us to find a point of tangency between our indifference curve and our budget line, simply saying we're trying to find the bundle of goods that is furthest to the right, giving us the most satisfaction that we can afford. That just lies on our budget line and our indifference curve furthest to the right. That gives us our x1. Let's now assume, as we did in our previous slide, that the price of good x falls. We know we're going to have a pivot off our budget line to the right. We now look for our indifference curve again furthest to the right that is just tangential to this new budget line. It gives us x2. The consumer, as we would expect generally, normally, is buying more of a good whose price has fallen. The consumer <clears throat> is, however, doing this in all likelihood for two perhaps complementary reasons. The good is relatively cheaper, and their purchasing power has increased. We're going to be using what we describe as a Hicksian decomposition to try to decompose the income effect from the substitution effect. Another alternative would be a Slutsky decomposition. Both generally give you sort of a similar result, especially if the price change is relatively small. So let's explain how that comes about. What this method does is that it asks us to calculate or to derive what we describe as a compensated budget line. Why do we need that? Well, let me remind you, the price of the good has fallen. Two things occur. One, the relative price of good x, px over py, falls. Secondly, the consumer's purchasing power increases. You buy, generally, more of a good that is relatively cheaper. Assuming that this good is normal, your purchasing power increases, you're also going to buy more for that reason. 
And so moving from x1 to x2 is sort of a combination of these two effects. If I want to think only about or substitution effect here, SE, If I want to think only about my substitution effect, then in a sense, what I need to do is to try to eliminate this. I'm going to ask the hypothetical question, if the relative price of good x had fallen as it did here, but my purchasing power did not change, how much would the consumer have, have bought in that case? So what we're doing is we're doing a thought process, asking a hypothetical question, how much would you have bought had the price, the relative prices changed, but the purchasing power did not? That's what we're doing here in our compensated budget line. We're allowing the new relative prices to remain, but in a sense, we're gonna sort of take away some of the consumer's income to give them just enough to afford, in a sense, the standard of living that they had before. It would be saying that they had no purchasing power change. So here, purchasing power increases. What we're doing is we're reducing their income to take away this purchasing power increase. New relative price, adjust the income to allow the consumer to buy a bundle that gives him or her the original level of satisfaction. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking this budget line, the new relative price, the, maintaining the new relative prices just means maintaining the slope. So we're going to take that budget line and we're going to shift it in until we get a point of tangency with our original indifference curve. That's going to tell us how much the consumer would have purchased initially if the purchasing power had not changed. That's what we're doing. We're simply taking this curve, maintaining the slope, shift it far enough in to get a point of tangency with our old indifference curve. It says you'd have bought XC. Originally, I'm buying X1. If we simply had our relative prices changing, but our purchasing power not changing, we would have bought XC, so this portion represents our substitution effect. It says, I'm buying more good X, not because it's going to make me happier, but simply because the relative prices of the good has now changed. And then it becomes sort of obvious that the difference between X2 and XC is now my substitution effect. You should be able to picture that our new budget line, original budget, new budget line BL2, is parallel to our sort of hypothetical compensated budget line. And so that's just representing an increase in income. So the movement from Xc to X2 gives us our income effect. That's just what we're summarizing here. Our total effect is just the entire movement X1 to X2. Our substitution effect is just the movement of X1 to Xc because we aren't being made happier. We're just adjusting how much of the good we buy because the relative price has changed. Same level of satisfaction. However, moving from XC to X2, that's no a real purchasing power change. And that's just a quick look at us decomposing the total effect into a substitution effect and an income effect. And with that deeper understanding of why consumers really change their consumption behavior when the price of a good changes, it puts us in a far better position to make good policy recommendations. Thanks for stopping by and do come back uh, for more video tutorials later on. Thanks.